My name's uh, James Pastor. I'm the new program director here at Clay Art Center. Um, thanks for coming for our uh, virtual artist talk with Doug Peltzman. Um, very exciting stuff. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about Clay Art Center to get started. And um, we are, if, if you're not familiar, uh, thanks for joining. And um, we are a uh, nonprofit located in Port Chester, New York. Um, in the Westchester, New York City suburb area, if you're not familiar, uh, north of Manhattan. Um, so a uh, really beautiful area, um, uh, shore, shore, shoreline, a lot of water, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I'm new to the area and really, really loving being here. Um, we were founded in 1957 and I'm showing you guys a little bit of what our mission is here because it's really important for Clay Art Center to offer um, uh, accessibility for all sort of ceramic education um, and and opportunities to learn more and engage with um, ceramics and and the makers behind them um, and so we're really happy to be here and and offering this um, as a part of our new virtual free uh, public offerings is really important so I wanted to say thank you um, if you were able to um, um, donate to this event, it, it goes a long way. And, and if not, um, we're happy that you're here and, and, and that's important too. And we want everybody to have the same access and it's, that's really important to us. So, um, so thanks again for that. So, so Doug, thanks for being here, buddy. I really appreciate it. Um, you and I met, what, uh, probably around 6, 2014 at, at Goggleworks, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. We, we, um, Goggle Work Center for the Arts is a uh, really wonderful art center located in um, Berks County, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, and um, was working there at the time. And we invited Doug down. We did, I think it was a five day, like full immersive five day workshop you did yeah. with us, right? Yeah. So it was the first time we met, um, and that was a blast. Doug, Doug sort of raged into the night in the studio with us, and, and we, had a, we had a really wonderful time. Um, and uh, that was the first time we've met. And Doug's a really wonderful um, potter, if, if I'm sure most of you are familiar with his work. But um, if not, um, Doug is a full-time studio potter in uh, Shokan, New York. Is that right, Doug? You're, yeah. You're, you're yeah. Great. Um, Doug has his MFA from Penn State um, in 2010. Um, he's a founding member of Objective Clay, uh, which is a really wonderful organization. If, if anyone um, hasn't, aren't aware of Objective Clay, I'd highly recommend checking that out. And then Doug, you, you recently started your Hudson Valley Pottery Tour. Um, you're the organizer and cr creator of that as well. So I'm sure you'll talk a little bit about that. But um, yeah, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you, James. I appreciate the introduction. Um, thank you, Clay Art Center, for um, putting together this programming for, for all of us uh, in this strange time where we're all sort of faced with. Um, uh, I think, you know, the only thing we can do uh, to the best of our abilities is deal with adversity um, in a way that's positive, right? So that's what um, I think we're all trying to do here. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. There's uh, about 37 of us here, uh, 39, including James and I. Um, and so my thought was for this to be not a formal artist talk in any way. Um, drinking out of a nice warm Mackenzie cup. Um, Beautiful. I've got a Chris Staley one here with my leftover coffee from the morning. Um, is for this to uh, be interactive as much as it can be. So, um, you know, if at any moment you have a question, please raise your hand or however it works and we'll get you up here. And, you know, the questions are going to be important because I feel like questions uh, allow me and us as a group to go off on tangents and sort of cover a lot of topics um, that I might not be able to, to just, you know, sort of conjure up because uh, just because of the nature of this one way mirror. So, um, so, James introduced me. I'm going to introduce myself a little bit again. Uh, I'm, I'm, my name's Doug Peltzman. I'm, I'm a studio potter. Um, I'm a full-time studio potter, so I make my living off the sales of my pots and the workshops that I teach. Um, I don't teach in academia. Um, 
and you, you know, the joy of coming to my studio on a daily basis is, uh, you know, is sort of like um, a gift. I feel like it's a privilege, but I feel like it's something that I never stop working for. I always um, recognize that and don't take it for granted. And it just requires an immense amount of um, work, always building, always buying some sort of new piece of equipment to, um, you know, just push the ideas forward. Um, that's kind of what, what I feel like making, why well, I love making pots and, and being an artist in general, but love making pots is for um, just this inner desire to always make something better, right? It's like you feel like you can always, no matter how great the pot is that you made the day before, you come to the studio because you feel like you can keep making that pot better. Um, and to me, that is a uh, sort of um, sort of a profound thing to uh, you know, and a, and and not, and again, something that you know, it's like a duty, right, to keep coming to the studio even when the days are stressful um, and you feel like it might be the last place you want to be that, that, that could be the moment where, uh, where the, where the, where the magic happens. Um, so I, the reason that my wife, my wife is a potter too. Her name is Pam. The reason that we live here in this area, which is just in the Southern foothills of the Catskill mountains, um, we live about 20 minutes from Kingston, New York, about five miles or so from Woodstock. Um, it's because we went to undergraduate, that's where Pam and I met um, at SUNY New Paltz. We fell in love with the area. Uh, we spent 10 years moving around, doing graduate school I, um, at Penn State, which was a, another amazing experience. Um, and then, you know, pivoting to starting a family, having three kids, and figuring out where we want to live, um, it was sort of an easy choice uh, in this in this region. Um, and so, uh, what, what what did I want to share? I have some books here I want to share. I want to share some uh, some thoughts about um, how to conjure ideas. Um, drawings and things. Does anybody have a question yet? Or, or we, can I just keep going? No questions, Doug, okay. yet. But, you know, may, you know, you showing your, your Warren McKenzie and your Chris Daly mug made me think, I wonder if, I wonder um, about your, your, your influences um, and your favorite potters. And maybe we can launch one of those polls and see if anyone's interested in that um, mm -hmm. and talking about any of your influences. Um, because I know so much of making is about, you know, who you work with and, and what came before you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm just... yeah, I mean, you know, the, I never met Warren, uh, but um, his pots have had a pretty, pretty uh, immense impact on me as of late. Um, and Chris's cup is, is very, obviously very important too. Uh, you know, the, the notion of, um, thinking about mentors and people who um, impact your, not just your work, but sort of like the way you think. Um, hey, Carol, I see your hand here. I'm gonna, um, Carol, I'm gonna promote you to panelist and, and, and get you on here. Your screen's gonna go down for a quick second. So, so just hang on tight. I'm gonna get you set up here, Carol. Sorry to interrupt, Doug. Carol. No, it's all good. Let's do it. Keep going. Yeah, so I was just saying, like, um, you know, I spoke with Penn State a couple weeks ago with their intermediate throwing class, and Chris, is, Chris Staley was the teacher. And one of the questions one of the students had was, was graduate school, you know, do you think that graduate school is necessary? You know, I, that's a very personal question, uh, whether or not graduate school is necessary. Hi, Carol. How are Hi. you? I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. I don't want to interrupt you, so I could wait till you finish that thought. Yeah, I was just going to finish by saying, like, you know, being asked if graduate school is necessary by your graduate school professor uh, is kind of a funny situation. Um, you know, 
because to me, it was very necessary. I mean, to me, it's a very personal thing. Uh, oh you know, graduate school changed how I thought. You know, it, it provoked questions that otherwise wouldn't have been posed to me. Um, and it, uh, it changed my life in every way, you know. Go ahead, Carol. So I was lucky enough to do your workshop at Clay Art Center. I don't know how many years ago you were there. But yeah. um, my thought is just recently, your work seems to have really changed. Yeah. Um, you know, you've, uh, you know, less of your lines maybe, and this w last firing is just so, you know, very different and so incredible. So if you could talk about what led you to that, was there anything yeah. or, you know, some change in your studio or just where you're at now? And I mean, both are so beautiful, but I was wondering what made, what happened that made such a drastic change? Yeah, no, that's a great question um, that I've been asked a lot lately um, because, you know, you know, it, it, it sort of, makes me think about the past decade of developing a body of work um, and, and getting to a place of success with that work and being able to put that work out there and sell that work and then completely sort of turning that on its head. Uh, you know, it sort of goes to my personality a little bit. Um, you know, not that I, uh, you know, not, you know, not that I'm like trying to uh, implode, but, um, <laughs> but, but like, uh, but just asking myself questions about um, the work I want to make. Uh, mm -hmm. So a couple years ago, I, I visited Minnesota and I toured a bunch of studios and I had a really amazing experience with Jan Makichi Johnston and Randy Johnston. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and over the years, I've just been collecting stoneware pots. I find I found myself collecting a lot of simple pots lately, um, and I started asking myself questions about what I wanted my work to be. Like, 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 you know, it, I wanted my work to more align with the work that I love to use. Right. You know, so I started to. You know, with the porcelain pots, I, I started to shift a little bit and simplify my drawings over the past year or so and, and try to make the work not so labor intensive in the way that it was, um, you know, but more labor involved in the formation of the objects. So, um, you know, so thinking about how I made before was I would make a batch of 40 pots um, and then those pots would um, get to the right consistency. They'd be trimmed, they'd be put under plastic, and then I'd have to inlay those at the right moment, right? And it was, it, 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 it was okay until it stopped being fun, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm, I'm gonna touch on a, a lot of things because I'm just sort of uh, stream of consciousness thinking about these things right now, but um, it got to the point where I just needed to find joy again in the studio. You know, though I was, and that's not to say that I wasn't invested in those pots anymore and I wasn't giving them my all, but I just wanted to make, you know, I wanted to make, you know, for a couple months, 300 or 400 pots without, go ahead. I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, quite frankly, just to be able to explore all the ideas that I had backlogged in drawings and in my mind that I just couldn't get to because the process of my older, the, of the porcelain work was inhibiting me from doing in a lot of ways. And I, and I wanted to explore some new forms, such as like- Thanks, a, you can take me down. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, thanks, Doug. And yeah, if you show everyone maybe the different work, that would be awesome. I'm going to keep riffing. Yeah. Okay, thank um, you. So like a form like this, right, which is a square jar. I mean, a, a triangular jar. I've been making them square too. It's thrown. Um, and it's thrown without a top. And the lid is thrown separate from the jar. And then that gets squeezed together without a top. Um, squeezed into this triangular shape and then the top gets added as a slab. I couldn't, I couldn't make those with porcelain. Um, they just would crack uh, when I tried to. And so, 
you know, the changing of the work had a lot to do with me wanting my, you know, me wanting to develop new forms and the material inhibiting that development. I see Dahlia's joining us yeah, here for a question. Yeah, Dahlia on. Hi, hi Dahlia, can you, you're on, can you hear us? On my Sunday's wrist. Oh, there you go. <laughs> hi, Dahlia. Hi, Dahlia. You can see me. Uh, there was no need to see me. I don't mind just talking. Uh, the, the, I, want, I wanted to sort of redirect a little bit um, your presentation. For some of us who are not as familiar with your work, I think it would be helpful to see some of the work that you, you have done before and after okay. and just show us more of your work so we can understand when you're talking about it, what is it you're talking about? Because it's very hard to visualize it. Yeah, so that's a great point. Maybe Thank everybody you, else is familiar with your work. I don't know. I am, but not enough. <laughs> great. Thank you, you Dahlia. Also, I've seen the work there, and it's lovely. But this um, take, take me off. Take me off. <laughs> so this would be something representative of my previous body of work. Um, so you know, a lot of this work had a lot to do with the gravitational movement of glazes. So I was using pooling glazes um, and the, uh, you know, I would, I would inlay black slip into the porcelain at leather hard stage and then bisque fire and then add glazes, right? So this is a more, um, a little bit more of a toned down one with this white um, sort of satin pooling glaze. And then the, uh, um, the little the little sun uh, or dots uh, colored dots in there um, and so this is sort of the work that I was referencing for those of you who aren't familiar with um, my old work um, that I'm pivoting away from uh, and then this cup would be something more representative of what I'm moving towards now um, you know I've I've just been you know, and, and, and when I say I've been thinking about these things, this doesn't mean that I wasn't thinking about these things when I was making the older body of work. Um, it's just that uh, I feel like I'm able to um, focus, um, you know, my attention more so on, uh, on the wheel throwing than I was before. Whereas before I might have had specific forms that I had been making for years. Um, whereas now I might throw, you know, more so throw, you know, 20 cups and really play with um, shape um, and tech. You could see on this line here, there's sort of subtle stamping in these lines, um, which are stamps taken from the treads of um, my kids' sneakers. Um, so really just trying to, um, play with ideas that I had put on the back burner for a long time, just because they didn't fit into the body of work that I was working on. So hi, we have Carrie. Car Carrie, Carrie's on? Yeah, I see. Yeah, um, yeah um, hi, hi, nice hi, to Carrie. see you, Doug. How are um, you? Uh, I'm well, thank you. Um, what, um, uh, the clay body that you're using now, what is the clay body and do you, oh no, no pictures, <laughs> I'm barely dressed. It's okay. okay. Uh, um, the clay body and where do you get it from and yeah so the new the, and and you know so I hadn't you know the, the pivot to the new work too has a lot to do with um, buying a gas kiln in January right. and in, in July and that gas kiln allowing me to fire in reduction again right mm -hmm. so when you start your own studio you know most of us have at our disposal an electric kiln because those are easily installable um, and a gas kiln might seem a little bit more far-fetched. So after, you know, years of wanting one, the opportunity came up to buy a used one. And so I did. So having that kiln, firing a couple firings with my porcelain reduction led me to buy some stoneware and try some glazes, try some of, the, some of the glazes that I had been using, which I'm still using these bases from my previous body of work mm -hmm. on the stoneware, um, but also to develop new glazes. And what happens with reduction firing is when you starve the kiln of oxygen, it, the, the kiln 
what fire needs is oxygen. So it reaches within the clay body. And what happens is all the, um, the oxides, the metal oxides in the clay, the iron, comes to the surface, mixes with the slips and the glazes. And that's why you get re really depth, uh, surfaces filled with depth. Um, so this clay body is, um, I don't know how well you could see it there, but it's a dark stoneware. It's called dark stone. Um, and it comes from Tucker's clay. Um, and I get it through Bailey's. Uh, Tucker's is in Canada, so I'm not sure where else they supply that, but Bailey's is my local supplier. Um, it's a really great clay to throw with. Um, I've found it to be, uh, you know, like, like I use a blowtorch a lot just to speed up the process. Um, to make tall things, you know, in two parts, mm. it, 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 it's so forgivable. It's strong. It has, um, I can talk about this more and more, but it has 12, it has like a 10% uh, of kyanite, which gives it really strong green strength. So before firing, like just the greenware pots are really strong, um, mm. which is nice for handling and things like that. If you're doing, you know, some decoration and, and, and whatnot, whereas porcelain would chip very easily. Right, very different than the porcelain. Yeah, Big okay. Time. Yeah, it's almost like, feels like concrete when it's dry. So there's not a red in there, though. It's a, just a dark stone where it looks a little reddish, no? No, it's not, it's pretty brown. Um, I can show you it raw. So this is, I'll, I'll just bring this over. I'm working on these fermentation jars right now. So you oh, can nice. get a point. That, uh-huh, okay. Pretty chocolatey in this stage. Great, thanks, Carrie. I'm gonna, I'm gonna- Okay, uh-huh. Thank you. Before, uh, before I take another question, yeah. um, let me just um, really quickly, because um, it seems like people, are there a bunch of questions lined up, James, that people- uh, we, we, have, we have one from Robin. She, okay. she's, she's asking just about your decoration and, and glaze process, um, specifically on those two pieces you were, you were showing right. us. Let, let's hear it, let's do it, since we're- uh, Robin uh, typed that in. So R Robin, do you, wanna, do you wanna get on mic here? If you'd like to raise your hand. She had typed that in, Doug, there you go. Oh, hi, Robin, I'll turn you on. Hi, Robin. Can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Hi, Robin. Would you like your Would you like your video on, Robin? Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. Hi, Robin. You can You can uh, You should be able to turn on your video. There Hi, you Robin. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good. Great. Yeah, I was curious, uh, particularly on the first piece that you showed, the teapot. I was wondering if you could walk us through how you decorated that. You mentioned that you did some black slip at the um, uh, leather hard stage, but I'd love to hear how all of that came to life on that first piece and also the second one. I'll do that. I'm going to get a, a little bit more of a complex one and then I'll show you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Okay, so here's another teapot. And this was fired in the gas kiln. This is uh, fired to cone 10 reduction. Um, you can see the lid. Um, so the way that I, I, so these are thrown on the wheel. Um, this is thrown in one section. And then when this pot is leather hard, I, I trim it. And then after leather hard, I let the, I, 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 I call it the stage in between bone dry and leather hard, whatever, whatever we call that. We all call that a little something different. Um, at that point, the entire pot gets waxed with like a Forbes wax, like a water-based wax, okay? And I might be doing that to 40 or so pots. So that by the time I'm done with the 40th pot, the first pot is ready to be inlaid. Because what happens with a water-based wax is when you apply it to a leather hard pot, that water from the wax goes into the pot and it softens it a little bit. So I, what I'm looking for when I carve into a pot like this is for the clay to kind of peel out, right? For it not to be all gummed up. So that when I 
make an incision, I can take a dry sponge and wipe it away and it'll be really clean. So basically this whole thing is covered in wax. I make all of my lines, my line work, right? I do, do it for the whole pot. And then I come along with black slip and liberally slap it on there, right? And then I have a, like a cosmetic sponge that I keep that's saturated in black slip. And then I come along and rub that black slip into all those recesses, making sure that it really gets inlaid in there. And the wax is protecting everywhere that I didn't carve, right? So that I can come along with a really wet sponge when all of that black slip is inlaid and wipe it all off really clean. Now, the reason that I don't do that after the bisque is because I found that inlaying porcelain with black slip after the bisque and sponging it off makes the pot really muddy, right? I didn't, I didn't like how muddy my glazes looked. I felt like they had much more pop if I did it, you know, that extra step before the bisque firing. And then, you know, what I, what I was doing and which I'm rethinking now with my new work is like, how do I glaze this new work? Because when I was drawing on these pots, I was telling myself how I was going to glaze it, essentially. I might not have known what colors were going to go where, but I knew that this would be a color and this would be another color. Right, so my compositional sort of scheming was getting figured out at the leather hard stage, and I was asked, I was answering a lot of, um, you know, potentially problematic questions that can happen to some of us in the glazing, like how do I glaze this? So, um, so then this gets bisque fired, and when it comes out of the bisque, it just looks, it's like a white pot with black inlay on it, and. So for instance, I'll just choose the blue area. So everywhere that's blue gets coated at that point in liquid latex, right? So that, I, so that I'm masking off that area. And then once that dries, I can dip or paint or however you apply glaze, the green glaze in here and not have to worry about getting that glaze or the cleanup here. So I apply my green glaze. And then once that green glaze dries, I wax over that, peel the latex off of this area, and then apply the blue glaze. Okay. Great. Um, it seems like- We have like... a question from Elizabeth here. Okay. Let's... Hi, hi, Elizabeth. Can you hear, can hi, you Elizabeth. hear us? Me now? Okay. Yep, you. Yeah. There you go. Um, Would you like your video on, Elizabeth? Um, it doesn't matter, sure. Um, yeah. This is so interesting. I've never done this zooming thing. Zooming. You're on. Okay. Um, was wondering uh, if you ever do spraying of glazes, and because I'm trying to set up a, a, a spray booth my mm -hmm. son is helping me build one yeah. and um was curious if you you know what you've found in spraying glazes um you know i don't spray glazes um i i sort of moved to brushing glazes in the past few years like you know you you know with this with a pot like this you could um spray glaze very easily and peel latex off to mask off areas. Um, you know, if sort of blending glazes is something that you're interested in, I think spraying is a good way to go about it. Spraying is a great way to go about like, you know, really even application of glazes. Um, you know, the reason I don't spray glazes is because I've always personally felt like a lot of glaze gets wasted. Um, and I, had a hard time just telling how thick, like like with spraying glazes, you really need to kind of scratch through and figure out, you know, you're gonna need to dial in how thick, you know, the you're filling up your canister with glaze. It needs to be fairly thinned out. And you're gonna need to figure out how many coats it takes to get an adequate application. You know, I think that's just gonna take trial and error to figure yeah. that kind of thing out. You know, it's the same thing with brushing a glaze too. You know, it's like, um, with dipping, you can figure out the specific gravity of your glaze and then 
always repeat that specific gravity. And then when you dip, you know you're getting the same thing every time. Um, with brushing and, 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 and spraying, there's a little bit of room there for, for human error uh, that, you know, you just have to dial it in, I think, you know. Talking to you're talking to someone who's never sprayed glazes before, so okay. I don't want to. Okay, yeah. never mind. <laughs> no, it's fine. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. There, Elizabeth, there is a great trick where you can actually, if you have a glaze you're familiar with, uh -huh. you could actually um, dip it as you normally would, so you you know that you have that great glaze layer, and okay. as a test piece, uh, just a portion of the pot, and then spray it. And as you spray, as you spray, it starts very very thin. And then you actually build up to you mat until you actually match that that previously dipped spot on the pot to give you an idea of how long it takes to match to get to that thickness. It's a really so, great little trick when you're spraying just to get okay. started. So when you when you dip it in, you you have like masking tape off an area. Yeah, or even if you had like let's say you had a piece of bisqueware like a mug, you can even just dip the rim. In, and you know that that's the thickness that you like, and then the rest of it is bare, and then you start spraying, and, and it will build up to that surface layer. Okay. And then you know, oh, it took me eight seconds to get that thick, or it took me 30 seconds. It, it's just a good way to start, that, to know that you're trying to get to that, to that end point and that thickness, so. Just right, and I've, I've, I've read from some there. people that, then once they figure out that this plate took so many ounces of glaze, they just put that much in the spray gun and just do it until it's gone. Yeah, D Doug, then, you you talk you mentioned about the waste on the on on the spraying. The spraying so 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 hard to um, pin down. Um, I I don't know how that would work. I've never tried that technique, but it, it seems okay. seems like it could could work. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Anything else to add, Doug? Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well. Good. Good luck with your spraying endeavors. That's great. Thanks, okay, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I think real quick before we take another question, uh, I'm gonna just give a quick studio tour. And then, you know, just because I feel like seeing people's spaces uh, is so helpful, especially if you have your own studio at home. I don't know how many of us have that uh, luxury right now. Um, if you do, I, I, you probably feel very lucky like me. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of show you really quickly like where I was just sitting. So I, in my studio here, because of having the pottery tour um, a, couple, a couple years ago, I set up, you know, I, I wanted the space to, you know, just like look a little bit nicer and have like a, a gallery corner. Um, so I have a cup shelf here and this gets transformed during the pottery tour into uh, a showing space and then I have these shelves back here and you can see these shelves are just two by fours with a hole saw hole in them and dowels like inch thick dowels coming out of them and they hold a ton of weight I mean I've had lots of plates piled up on these um, so it's just a real cheap and they have rough cut wood as shelving a cheap solution um, you know to make shelving you know I, I work in a in a garage studio and you know it's about 12 by 24 feet so it's like 240 square feet and you can do a lot with a small studio space um you know and i think one of the things i love about it is that i'm always thinking about how to make the space more efficient um and to add things to it so that kind of takes you around and then this is the table where i do all of my work all of my building you can see i have a um a Banding wheel up on a cinder block just so I'm, 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 I'm standing a little bit higher when I work. Um, you know, I'm always thinking about my back. I keep my, these are some of the test tiles I'm currently, colors I'm kind of currently figuring out. There's some satin matte ones, some chino glazes that I'm kind of playing with altering and other things. Um, and then over here is my shelving system which holds about 250 uh, bone dry and bisque pots. And it doesn't look like it would, but it goes all the way up to the ceiling. Um, it holds, it was real cheap to make under a hundred bucks. It's two by fours and furring strips. Um, the 
sheetrock wear boards, thick sheetrock, slide in and out so I can make any height that I need. Um, you know, working in a small space is all about, uh, you know, figuring out how to make it work. Um, and so, you know, all of these things have happened and been built upon over the past four years. Like I didn't move in to this space and just kind of know. Um, I worked in the space, saw what was lacking, and then, you know, built upon that. And so the table that this computer's on right now is sort of like the central nervous system. I have this 10 foot by three foot butcher block table in my studio. And that takes us over to the other wall. So when, when I moved in here, that like I said, this was just a garage. So I had to figure out solutions like a sink. Um, you know, I know a lot of this stuff might not be interesting to some of you, but to some of you it might be. Um, you know, I had to have a sink in here and I had to have a sink where the water needed to go out. And I couldn't do that because of some engineering and structural issues. So what I installed was a laundry pump under the sink down here, which pumps the water. There's a check valve in it. it pumps the water up this pipe here, up, and then it, it's gravity fed um, out, of, out, out of the house. So, um, you know, there's ways to make things work. Uh, and then the, this is my wheel throwing area. I have a wheel, I have two wheels. I have a world, uh, creative industries wheel that I use a lot for throwing big pots and I use it for, there's a diamond thing on there now for polishing pots and leveling them off. And then over here is uh, where I make and trim all of the work. Um, I throw standing, I can't advocate enough if throwing standing is something you would ever think about trying. Um, it saved my life really as a potter. Uh, I used to throw sitting in graduate school. I, I'm I'm healthier, I feel healthier as a 40 year old than I did as a 30 year old. Um, so my wheel is bolted to the wall and I throw standing at the side of it. I don't throw from the front of it like uh, most of us might. And I control the foot pedal with my hand, um, which means that I, I pretty much set a speed and then throw with that speed or I set a speed and trim with that speed. You know, so that my hand movements are directly proportional to the speed at which the wheel is moving. Another thing to mention over here, which is pretty cool, is I have these magnetic strips. They hold all my ribs. So it's, it's a simple thing, but it makes a world of difference to organize your tools, trimming tools also. Um, and they're cheap. Uh, Harbor Freight is a great resource. Um, right now the computer's on a banding wheel, so I'm just gonna kind of turn you around I have some storage of tools and whatnot. And then I have a 30 ton ram press, which is a fun little, um, well, it's a fun little 2000 pound uh, tool to have, which I make pots on. Um, and if anybody wants to know more about ram pressing, I can talk more about that. But so these bowls, faceted bowls are ram pressed. Um, and these plates, these square plates, are ram pressed. I don't know if you can see, but there's a real subtle texture carved into those. Um, so, and then turning in this direction is where my kilns are. Okay, so my kilns are in my studio. When it comes to bisking time, it can get a little hot in here in the summer, but I have a exhaust fan, an industrial exhaust fan that goes in this window right here. Um, and the kilns themselves are exhausted. And I have another window over here. This is my actually my first studio with windows, which is really nice. So I can create a vacuum of uh, fresh air in and hot air out. Um, the studio has been sealed off from my house with weather stripping on the doors. Um, so I can really make a, like make a, a sealed space um, and we recently bought a medical grade H13 HEPA filter, you know, having a studio and then just that sort of, and then I have another little test kiln down there, but that sort of brings you around to the, to where we started some bisque on the shelves. Um, I have a studio, a medical grade HEPA filter, uh, HEPA filtration, which we purchased, um, 
which helps with the air quality like you would not believe it's re really great um, to have uh, so that's just a little studio tour um, I'm trying to think if anybody else has any questions uh, I wanted to share a couple um, a couple books with you all uh, that I love like I know a lot of us are, are, are always learning and looking to buy new books. Does anybody have the Potter's Dictionary out there? Um, you know, in this book, you could look up, you could turn to any page and you could look up any topic, just turning to the iron oxide page. And, you know, you can figure out any information about iron oxide. Um, it's melting point. Uh, you know, years and years ago, I had this, um, this uh, experiment that I was doing when I was wood firing with, with zinc. I just took a couple chunks of zinc and threw them in a wood kiln. And when I, we opened up the kiln, the zinc was gone. And I was like, where did the zinc go? And apparently zinc volatizes in reduction. So it was gone. It, it turned into a gas and went up and out the chimney. Um, whereas in an oxidation firing, it stays and it acts like a flux. So, you know, things like that, that I can reference um, in that book, which become uh, which becomes pretty pretty amazing. Um, James, do we have anybody with hands we, raised? Or? We we just had two, but they they went they went down. Does anybody have uh, Elizabeth? Here we go. Hi, Elizabeth. You're you're back on. Yeah, you don't have to put up an image. Um, was just wondering. You mentioned that your wife was a potter as well. Do you guys share a studio, or does she have a similar setup in the other part? Yeah, of the I mean, Pam has her her own studio across the way. Yeah, so um, the, the one tool that's not in here that's in her studio, because her studio is sort of like the porcelain space now, um, she makes porcelain pots, is, uh, is the pug mill and her wheel. Um, and we're still um, just finishing the floor in there. So yep, she has her own studio, which is important for, for us. We love each other. Um, you know, uh, our love runs very, very deep, but we also love to uh, have our own space. I, w I really wouldn't want to subject her to, um, to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. I, I'm a little bit of a, not a control, well, maybe a little control freak, you know, like tools and things. I don't know if you can tell, like, um, but I didn't clean up my studio for this, uh, for this virtual talk like this is my studio this is how it looks all the time i at the end of a work day i clean up um my studio being in my home you know i mean i would be like this even if my studio wasn't in my home but my studio being in my home makes me even more aware of me, the floor needing to be cleaned um you know there's a, a door a sort of a door there's a doorway right out here that goes out to the driveway um, and this is sort of like the, the the front door, kind of like to come into the house, people walk through my studio. So, um, you know, I'm hyper aware of, uh, of just keeping it clean. Um, and, you know, I'm in it all day too. Um, and I, I like to, you know, we are all different. Some of us need to work in how we need to just pick up where we left off the day before. Um, Whereas I need to clean my tools, I need to come back to a fresh space um, to uh, to begin work. So we, I hope some of this information you. is valuable to to everybody. Um, oh, Dahlia's back. Hey, Dahlia. Hi, Dahlia. You're on. On mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Um, I was just wondering. You mentioned something that. You said it was a, a tool or something that cost $2,000 at RAM, RAM or something, and you showed some pieces that came out of it. I'm totally unfamiliar with it. Can you explain it again? Sure. Well, it's, uh, it's, it, you know, I, I said it weighed, the machine itself weighed 2,000 pounds. It's a, a oh, it's RAM. Pounds, not the yeah, I mean, they cost a lot more than $2,000, but... Um, wow. I was able to buy this, they cost about 30,000 to get up and running, but I was able to buy this machine from, um, from a bank that had repossessed it. Uh, so I got it sort of at auction for pretty cheap. Um, so a RAM press is a 30 ton hydraulic press that 
that has a, a plate on top that you bolt a mold to and a plate on the bottom that you bolt a mold to. So the, the mold on the top, if you can imagine, would be the shape, the interior shape of a cup. And then the mold on the bottom would be the exterior shape of a cup or a bowl, right? And then when you put those two things together, the negative space that's left in there is your object, if that makes sense. So what you basically do is you put a ball of clay down in the bottom mold, you push those two molds together, and the molds themselves are very complex um, technical feat. The molds have uh, a network of mold duct tubing inside of them, and they're hooked up to air compression so that when you squeeze that clay together, you push air through the mold, and the microscopic, I'm gonna get very technical, I'm sorry if I'm losing some of you, but the microscopic pores in the mold, like the mold has pores like our skin has mold, uh, has pores. And the mold, when you push air pressure into the mold, the mold sweats water, which allows the, the clay to release from the mold. So when you push those two molds together and you have that object under pressure, and then I push a, a, a button with my foot, which, which pushes air to the bottom mold. Nice. That object is stuck. Like this, say this cup was just pressed out of the mold. This yes. cup is stuck to the top mold at that point. And then with board, put a whipboard under that cup and then push a foot pedal release, push air to the top mold, which releases the cup from the mold. Now the benefit of making objects this way is that I can make a square plate once I have my mold made, which is an immense amount of work, proto in the mold for that object. But once that mold is bolted to that ram press and I'm making square plates at the click of, you know, 50 to 100 in a morning, you know, you see the benefits of it really quickly. Because for you to make a square plate with a square foot by making it by hand, uh, is very complicated. And another thing that the ram press does is it compresses clay under 30 tons of pressure. And what happens is we all know that clay has a memory, right? Well, under 30 tons of pressure, the memory is sort of erased. Um, and what happens is, is there's very, very minimal warping. You know, there's a tiny percentage of things that might come out of the bisque firing with a weird crack, you know, just because of the nature of clay. But 90% of those objects make it through the glaze firing with no warpage, right? So, um, so the reason that I invested in this technology was that years ago I was making faceted cups and I thought about how can I make these cups without having to throw a thick cup, facet it, whittle it down to get the weight right. And I thought about slip casting them, but what I loved about that cup was that the interior was round and the exterior was octagonal. Now with a slip cast uh, mold, you would lose that. The, the, the form of the cup takes on whatever that exterior shape of the mold is. But with a ram press, you can make a different interior shape of your mold than is the exterior shape. Anyway, it's a long conversation. I hope, I hope that answered your question um, and didn't confuse anybody too much. Thanks, Doug. We have uh, Carrie, Carrie back. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Um, hi, hi. Just a couple of quick questions about the yeah. process with porcelain. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that you, uh, the slip you use, you use slip from your own clay body. You don't, have you ever used underglaze or do you find that it's, it would be interchangeable? I, the reason I like to use my clay body slaked down into a slip is because it fits the clay really well, right? And then do you use a black mason stain? Do you exactly. just use black, black mason stain? Yeah. And you that? can color, you know, you can color any. Right. You probably remember that from the workshop, but yeah, I would take a cup of my slip to like 50 or 40 grams of any mason stain to get like a saturated colored slip would work really well. 
And what, what's the black that you like to use? What's I use 6600. Oh, you do? Okay. 60, okay. Um, the reason I don't use underglazes for inlaying is because I like when I inlay slip for it to be flush with the surface. Uh huh. Whereas okay. with the, you know, with the, with the un Amico underglaze or something right. like that, pulls right, it pulls in, you wouldn't be able to kind of build that surface up. Oh, okay. And then the other question, why uh, water-based wax? See, I use, so I use water-based wax on greenware. Right. Because it doesn't peel. Like, like if I was to use a more like mobile, like, like a, a more ammonia based wax right that's more of a plastic coating and when you mm -hmm. go to carve through it i found that it was peeling too much uh, ah. where the water-based wax was just like break breaking through the surface in a in the way that worked for me because i find mine peels as well so if using water-based would, would kind of stop that probably potentially yeah i mean okay. it also has a lot to do with the consistency of the clay right yeah. okay all right, thank you. A lot of those those things, and I say it in workshops too, a lot of them are so personal to like trial and error and what works for you. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah. All right, any, um, um, any other questions, folks? You know, a couple, um, you know, just, it's, uh, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, th think a little bit about some things that I've been, uh, you know, this, you know, I don't really, um, uh, you know, sort of, uh, what am I trying to say? I don't really take on New Year's resolutions, but this, this year I, I kind of did a little bit. I started writing um, more, which has been helping me sort of, um, you know, sort of encapsulate my days um, and my thoughts a little bit, but I also started uh, doing ink, ink drawings and ink paintings, um, which have been, you know, just a nice way to think about form and think about shadow and color. Not, well, not really color, but like shadow and form and contrast as a way to, um, you know, kind of, and they don't even have to be, you know, your work. Like this is a Michael Simon picture, you know, from a, from a, uh, you know, pictures from a, from, these are some of my cups, um, uh, from books, right? Um, this is a Hans Koper. Um, you know, just a way, just way, ways to get my brain sort of um, thinking a little bit differently, I feel like has been a goal of mine, you know, to not be so, um, you know, worried about, if I've, you know, produced enough that day, um, you know, I don't know if it's age or me just wanting to um, take a little bit of pressure off of myself that I put on myself over the years. Um, but I'm trying to really allow my work and my new work um, to just uh, be a little more open to, um, to following my curiosities. I feel like um, anytime you can uh, allow your or incorporate uh, moments for play into your studio practice, I mean, that's when you'll, you know, discover things. That's when you'll, you know, it might seem stupid. It might seem silly at the time. You might think this is like the ugliest thing I ever made. But those things also, you know, could potentially inform you in a completely profound way. Um, so, uh, you know, I can't, I can't express that enough. Um, I'm trying to, trying to think, think if I can add anything more as we sort of round out the hour. I know it was, it's been sort of informal. Um, I hope everybody got something out of it. Um, we have a couple, couple questions pop, yeah. popping up here, Doug. Um, Audrey, hi Audrey, you're on. Can you hear us, Audrey? Hi. Hi. So we're coming from State College, Pennsylvania. Wow. Cool. Right. Um, there's a with, few of us here. Yeah, there's a few of us here. Brad Clem, Kat Henderson, and Oh, yes. The Be Well oh. Collective. Are you being yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 
So, Brad, would you guys like your video on? Yeah, we could do that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. let's see. Let's right. see these folks. I'm going to promote you real quickly. <laughs> We lose them. Yeah, we lost them. Looks like we might have. We'll see. We'll let yeah, let's. I'll keep an eye. See if they pop pop back up here. Okay. Um, here we there go. There they are. Yeah, they are. Are we back now? <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah. Wow, I don't know. What That's cool. I don't know what happened. Oh, we can do this <laughs> way. All right, so. We're just, we were just wondering so much about your new work, and it seems like fairly dramatically different than what you had been making previously. And it seems like a bit of a creative risk, and it seems kind of like a business risk to make such a change. And so I guess we, I don't know how to word this quite right, but I just, we just wanted to hear what your thoughts are about it. Yeah, like, what are you thinking? You, that's like career suicide. Like, well, no, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's yeah, really interesting when an artist makes that. Kind we, of do you feel like we even go through that during grad school? For me, like, you know, that yeah, you know, I'm, I'm ten, I, you know, this, I'm coming up on ten years anniversary of graduating from Penn State, so maybe I was due. Um, I. I think that um, you might you you may have heard this. You know, I think Max was in the conversation a couple of weeks ago with Chris, uh, and you know, I brought up something that I think about from Chris in, in in you know directly connected to what we're talking about here, which was a conversation I had with Chris probably twelve years ago about a teapot that he used to make that was this iconic teapot. Okay, it was like this square black and white teapot that was a signature in some ways of his, like it was symbolic of his work at the time, you know, and um, somebody asked him in the group, or maybe, I don't, I don't remember how the question was posed, but like, why don't you make that teapot anymore, right? And Chris answered by how you know, I might answer this question in that he could have made that teapot for the rest of his life and sold that teapot for the rest of his life. But creatively, that teapot had run its course for him. So, you know, this is a heavy question um, in that, uh, you know, I'm still grappling with that, you know, in like, you know, the work that I'm making now and feeling like, for the past um, couple months, like somebody died or like I divorced something, you know, like really having this like feeling in my heart and my gut, like of saying goodbye and then saying hello um, and opening myself up to new, new ideas, but not really, um, you know, so a lot of it, I think, on, on a very base level just had to do with me being exhausted or exhausting my ability to keep developing that body of work. I felt like it hit in a good way for a long time and it fed me creatively for a long time, but it stopped being fun mm -hmm. and I needed to find joy again in the studio you know this is just um you know and then and then getting the kiln but also getting the gas kiln opened up new possibilities and i wanted to start i started to see my work in a way where i wanted my work to more align with the pots that i wanted to use on a daily basis and um, I think back on the trajectory of my life as a, as a, as a ceramic person, as an artist, as a potter, and early on, right off the bat, 
in 2003 when I started making pots and was first exposed to clay, I started reduction firing and wood firing. And that was my entry point into clay. And quickly soon after that, I found myself in graduate school at Penn State asking myself big questions about what my work meant and how I wanted what I was saying to align with the work I was making. And that took my work on the path that it's been on the past tech decade, the past 10 years. And so circling back, I have felt like I never really ever really investigated the things that I fell in love with when I first came to clay. So, you know, maybe it's a 40 turning 40, like midlife crisis situation, or, you know, maybe it's just, uh, you know, like, like me wanting to make pots that celebrate the phenomenology of glaze and not necessarily my impact as, you know, putting, putting surface decoration on the pot, but making, you know, letting the glazes have that inner, inner beauty. You know, a lot of it also, when I've lately been thinking about really like the question you're asking, like what's so, it, is, cause in my mind, it's not so drastic, but I feel, I know from the outside looking in, it's like, whoa, what's up, you know? Because in my mind, this has been happening for a long time. But my my middle child, my son Leo, is so into geology and rocks, like in a way that's like extremely passionate, like to the point where we're finding rocks, we're breaking them open, you know, we're figuring out what they are, we're looking at their colors, we're identifying things, and like just the, like looking at a rock and and like digging into the beauty of a rock maybe has a lot to do with it too yeah. like not you, you know like n not wanting my glazes just to be like transparent color anymore but wanting them to be like like a mineral a world of mineralogy you know and geology and gemology and all these words he throws around so <laughs> you know it's it's there's so much and it's all still rapidly or slowly evolving in my mind about the switch and then that that also so that's sort of like the interior sort of um you know maybe you know thinking about what's going on but then there's also like the the creative like you said business risk i think that was your word um terrifying Right, like I'm a full time potter, like I make a living off the sale of my work. Um, but I've always been pretty stubborn, I've, I've never had a plan B. Um, and so I feel like jumping in, you know, to unknown water is something that potters do all the time. So I felt like, or I didn't feel like it, but I'm prepared for that, you know. And you know, I think what it'll do is it'll what it has shown me is that the people who have collected my work over the past 10 years, I might lose a lot of those people, but I'm going to also bring a lot of new people in who are interested in some of the new things that I'm working on. Um, and just how those pots can fit into domestic space in a different way than the older, older pots did. Um, uh, well, it takes a lot of courage to uh, do something like that. And it's really inspiring. So thank you. Yeah, I don't know. I can keep rambling about it. I don't know. if <laughs> I, I'm sure I touched on some of your questions, but thank you. I for, think that was great. Yeah. Thanks for provoking that question. I think that's uh, um, important for all these folks to hear. So mm -hmm. thanks for joining us, thanks, you guys. guys. Yeah, no thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Stay well. All right. You all uh, yeah. You all be well. You um thank thank you so much, Doug. Um any any last questions before we wrap things up, folks? Well thanks. Uh Carrie Carrie has one more. Doug? Yeah. Carrie. Hi Carrie. Uh, You're on. 
Okay, I'm wondering if we can get Doug back for a workshop. I missed him last time, I wasn't here then, and I know I mentioned it during the Hudson Valley Pottery Tour, so I'm sure a lot of us would love that. Just to kind of plant that seed, James. Oh, he, he knows I'm gonna ask him. He knows well, it's coming. Uh, well, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would love yeah. to. I'd love to talk about stoneware and reduction firing, yeah. and all these things I'm kind of touching on. You know, I, I, I just want to apologize. I know we're all he, some, who, forever, whoever's still here, you know, it's like we're all like doing these Zoom things and, you know, trying to uh, stay connected in new reality for a little while. And it's awkward, you know, me staring at a screen, looking at my own face. I'm glad I can see James. Um, <laughs> But, you know, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's great to have you all out there. Um, I thank you all for, for being here. Um, like I said before, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed spending a little time with me and with all of you. And I just wish you all well. I hope you all, everybody stays well and, um, and that we can give each other hugs when we see each other. That'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doug. And, um, you know, it, it's funny to talk about a workshop, right? When, when we're in our studios and we're the only ones allowed in sort of thing. So I think um, it should be said to, um, you know, stay safe and, and um, be kind to each other and be patient with each other at, at this really crazy time and um, take solace in, in our studios if you can. And, um, and uh, thanks so much. Really appreciate everybody coming out. Thank you for your time, Doug. It was really a pleasure as always. And um, till next time. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Bye, everybody.